Hi, I'm Dustin Abbott, and I'm here today at one of my favorite spots to uh, shoot infinity here. Um, there's a lot of depth to this scene behind me there, and the fact that I can shoot from a high kind of location allows me to have a lot in focus at the same time. And that's really appropriate when I am looking at the image quality of a lens like the new Sigma 14 millimeter f1.8 art series lens, because this is obviously a lens that a lot of people are looking at as a landscape lens. And so here at a landscape type scene, I'm going to do a comparison just as a benchmark to a lens that I'm familiar with and perhaps some of you are familiar with, and that's Tamron's 15 to 30 millimeter f2.8 VC lens. So while the Tamron isn't obviously quite as wide, either in terms of focal length or as an aperture value, um, I can at least start the comparison at um, f2.8 and just kind of use it as a benchmark to see just how well the Sigma is performing in this kind of infinity landscape type scene. So I'm going to shoot a series of images at various aperture values and then we'll jump in and we'll look at the images together, compare and contrast and see how this newest competitor from Sigma stacks up against a lens that really has held up pretty well against uh, a lot of the other lenses that have been released since it. So let's jump in, let's take some shots. Okay, so we're here to take a look at the infinity performance of the Sigma 14mm f1.8 art. And so I just wanted to give you a quick look at an image globally. Obviously at f1.8 the depth of field, even with such a wide angle lens, is fairly shallow um, or you know shallow-ish and so our foreground is not in focus. However, you can see that the plane of focus does start to begin fairly early in the image. All of these images are focused on this stand of trees right here, kind of midway through the scene, but fairly close to infinity focus. So one thing you're going to note is that even at f1.8, this is a really a quite impressive performance. You can see a bit of drop off right towards the edge of the frame, but this swath, you know, about three quarters of the way through the center of the frame at f1.8 is really quite fantastic. I mean, that's a lot of resolution, a lot of detail resolved. And uh, it's important to note that in this area here, where, you know, while we can see the resolution starting to drop off, what we're not seeing is a lot of chromatic aberration in this very high contrast area here. And so, you know, all in all, that's, uh, that's a pretty impressive result. And of course, there's nothing at 14 millimeters f1.8 that I can compare the lens to. This lens is completely unique in that. But, um, you know, those of you that were disappointed with the last 24 to 70 f2.8 art not being kind of optically superior, well, you can rest assured that this lens, though it's expensive, it is back on track and being optically superior for sure. Now, there is some vignette in the extreme corners, but, you know, to be frank, I've seen a whole lot worse than this. And so, um, you know, there's not a whole lot there that I'm, I'm personally disappointed by. I think that's a pretty stunning performance at f1.8. Now, if we stop it down to f2, we'll use the, own, our, the lens itself as a benchmark here. And, and so looking towards the center of the frame, you know, there's, there's not really a huge amount of difference other than I think that the contrast has taken a bit of an uptick in some of this area. I just see a little bit more fine resolution. If we look out towards the edge of the frame, I, if there is some extra resolution reaching into the corners, I'm not really seeing it yet. Uh, one looks about the same as the other. Depth of field, you know, may have creeped just a, a hair closer, but it doesn't really look like it's, it's all that different. And so I think that your difference between f1.8 and f2 is not worth messing with. So one thing between f1.8 and f2.8 before we look at the resolution is that you can definitely see some vignette clearing. So from one f1.8 here to f2 here, you can see a minor lift. However, the difference between f2 and f2.8 is more dramatic. And now we really have a very nice lifting to where the image is fairly free from vignette even at f2.8, which of course is where most lenses are just starting. And so pretty impressive there. Now here side by side, you can see the significant difference between f1.8 and f2.8 as far as the vignette. But how about in terms of resolution? Well, if we jump into the middle of the frame here, 
Uh, I do. I do prefer the contrast that I'm seeing in the center of the frame um, at f2.8. I think that there is just a little bit more bite to the image. Look at this compared to this. Uh, looking towards infinity, you know, it already it already looked pretty good towards infinity in terms of showing detail and resolving into the distance. I just think that maybe we're seeing a little bit more contrast there. Now, if we move out towards the edge of the frame, I am now starting to see an improvement. Part of that is a lift of vignette that is making this look less muddy on this side. But also we're gonna see that there, the resolution itself, like in these leaves here, is extending more towards the corner. And also this area, although it's obscured by vignette, on this side you're seeing more detail emerge. And so just a stronger uh, performance edge to edge. Look even here. Yeah, so, some of that is vignette, but you can also see the textures are muddier than what they are here. And so even this fence that goes through here, you can definitely see a difference in the way that it's resolving. So definitely an uptick at f2.8 and a really nice uh, resolution result um, here at f2.8. I mean, f1.8 was impressive, but of course you're shooting in you know, landscapes close to infinity, it's unlike you're gonna shoot at f1.8, or frankly, for that matter, very often at f2.8 either. Now at f2.8, I can at least start to bring a point of comparison to bear. And so while it's not purely apples to apples, um, and that the Tamron 15 to 30 only goes to you know 15 millimeters as opposed to 14 millimeters. And so let's just first, let's take a quick uh, peek at that. And so here you can see the difference in the width of the frame, definitely more in the frame on the Sigma on the left side. If we look at the right side, just the ratio between these branches and the edge of the frame, definitely some extra width um, on the Sigma compared to the Tamron. And so, I mean, I would say, at least using this benchmark of this Tamron, that you're getting a, a nice wide 14 millimeters, and, and I, it seems like you're getting a good performance there. Now, uh, one thing that I, I will note that stands out to me as being a significant pro to the Sigma versus the Tamron, and we're gonna see there is some give and take here, but the Tamron does suffer from some lateral chromatic, chromatic aberration towards the edge of the frame, and uh, that will persist you know, even as you stop the lens down, but you'll see a little bit of green and purple fringing um, that is there. The Sigma is much cleaner with that, and as a result, at the edge of the frame, it's going to have a little bit more apparent resolution because of the lack of chromatic aberration um, that limits that somewhat. Looking at the two images as a whole, you can see that you know while the Tamron is actually quite good in the vignette department, it definitely has more vignette right now than what the Sigma does. And the Sigma, of course, we've seen the vignette clear up. Now, just to give you a quick idea of the vignette clear up on the Tamron, that's from f2.8 to f4. And so there is some vignette. It's not really all that heavy on the Tamron. Looking at the kind of image as a whole, I would say that the Tamron seems to have a little bit better contrast and maybe a little deeper a color saturation. In terms of at the very center of the frame, resolution looks pretty similar between these two lenses. And I, you know, the, if the Sigma has an advantage here, it's, it's so light as to be kind of imperceptible for field use. Looking at this structure here, it looks, you know, roughly the same. Um, out to about this section, I think that, you know, things look roughly the same. However, if we could just go a, a just a little bit further, we're going to see that there is a little bit of improvement showing from the Sigma. You know, for example, this light here, you can definitely see that it's it's just crisper um, on the Sigma than it is on the Tamron. And so center of the frame, I would say that the Tamron has fairly similar bite at f2.8 or resolution, maybe a little bit better contrast overall but uh, and a little bit better color saturation but definitely not as good of resolution towards the kind of edges of the frame and uh, and you can see here that you know there's probably a little bit difference in because of the wider maximum aperture that of depth of field which i sometimes see with wide aperture lenses but surprisingly for as strong a performance as we've seen 
uh, from the Sigma, the Tamron is actually doing a fairly good job of holding its own, with the exception of the lateral chromatic aberration and the resolution falling off here towards the edges of the frame. And we saw that on both sides. And it's just in this area, it's not quite as good, although it's, to be fair, it's also not a night and day um, advantage for the Sigma. So if we stop both of these down to f4 and we look at our plane of focus here in the center, really these lenses, they look more similar than different. I do think that maybe the, tam the uh, Sigma, I should say, has a hair better uh, light transmission here in the center of the frame. However, it's kind of hard to read too much into that considering the fact that, you know, out of doors, the, the lighting can vary a little bit. Um, but as we look at these images here, once again, resolution wise at the center of the frame, they look, you know, pretty much the same in this area. I think once again, the color saturation is just a little bit better on the uh, Tamron. And so I, I do kind of like the contrast and the color rendition just a hair better. But again, these look pretty similar. Now, as we move out towards here, I would say that the Tamron is sticking close until we get to about here. And then I think uh, that final kind of quarter or fifth of the frame, the Sigma is definitely the better looking. Um, obviously no vignette here at this point for the Sigma, but beyond that, the textures to me just look a little crisper. Now, as we move into prototypical, you know, landscape apertures, F5.6, F8, Again, looking at the images as a whole, uh, once again, I you know I just is looking at the two side by side. I do like the Tamron a little bit better because it seemed to have a little bit more you know kind of you know contrast pop to it and a little deeper color saturation. So, for example, if we uh, zoom in here to these grasses in the foreground, you'll see that the colors just have a little bit deeper, richer saturation. You know, all of our settings are identical here. I just think that the uh, color renditions may be a little bit better out of the Tamron. Um, if we look, you know, towards kind of our traditional spots here, at this stage, we're really not going to see a whole lot of difference. Um, you know, they look... they look great. I mean, bottom line, they look great. How about if we move out towards the edge of the frame? Here, I, you know, it, even stopping down, I'm not seeing necessarily a huge, huge improvement on the Tamron. The Sigma stayed pretty consistent. And so, I mean, bottom line, if you want edge to edge sharpness, the uh, Sigma is delivering a, a more consistent edge to edge resolution than what the Tamron is. Now, as a final comparison here, uh, at least in the Infinity for resolution, I, I wanted to do something to where I, I set a custom white balance. And so we could also check kind of, you know, color reproduction. I've mentioned color a bit here. And so I set a, a custom white balance of 5,700 Kelvin here. And, and so, and all the other settings are identical. We're now at F, at, at F8. Um, shutter speed is one, one twenty-fifth of a second. So, you know, everything here is pretty much equalized, but you can see that they do deliver a, you know, just a little bit different looking result. Once again, the Tamron has just a little bit more visual punch. Um, at the same time, the Sigma seems to have a little bit better uh, colored or light transmission to it. And so it delivers a slightly brighter uh, result here. But again, if we look towards the center of the frame, kind of at this very traditional aperture, you know, like in this section, definitely more color saturation there. And in the greens here, just a little bit deeper, if I could use the term more complex color rendition. And I've already already noted in the past that of the, the Tamron lenses that I've used, this really stood out uh, in the over the predecessors in that it delivered to me what I felt was somewhat Zeiss-like color accuracy and, um, you know, better than the, you know, the kind of the cut of the mill Tamron lens at the time. Of course, Tamron has improved a lot since the release of this lens in general, but here we see just a, you know, a nice amount of punch and, but definitely a little bit different, you know, kind of color rendition, maybe a little bit cooler and a little bit more kind of magenta bias to the uh, to the Tamron, whereas here we have on the Sigma a little bit warmer and maybe a little bit more um, towards the, the greens there. Now, has the Tamron managed to clear up here at the very edge of the frame? At F8, it looks better 
but you know at the same time i think the sigma looks better still at this point it's not vignette so much it's affecting things here it's more just the the sigma is resolving better towards the edge of the frame and that's that's it bottom line and so i would i would say that our resolution champion here is the sigma in that while both lenses are roughly similar in the you know center portion of the frame if you move out to the edges of the frame the uh, Sigma improves more than what the Tamron does. Although, you know, if you look towards the extreme corners here, uh, the Tamron is actually looking pretty good by comparison. But in that center swath that we've been looking at, the uh, Sigma definitely shows some merit there. So as you can see, um, there definitely are some pretty serious strengths for this new Sigma 14 millimeter F1.8 art lens. And one of those, of course, is the fact that it is a very sharp lens, even at f1.8. And so on that note, I do want to say a big kudos to Sigma, because once again, they've pushed the envelope in terms of what's possible in terms of a maximum aperture at a certain focal length while still giving a very strong optical performance. And so one thing that they have done very well is optimizing for wide open performance on a lot of these art series lenses. And this lens is no exception to that. And so we saw that compared to the uh, Tamron lens, this definitely does a more credible job of giving you at, particularly at wide apertures, giving you resolution consistently all across the frame. Now in the center of the frame we saw the Tamron is just as good and it actually does have some strengths in terms of the actual maybe micro contrast and uh, color saturation but at the same time the Sigma also has the strength of having extremely low chromatic aberration including no you know real for at least for fuel purposes no real lateral CA along the edges of the frame it also has for such a wide maximum aperture it has a surprisingly low amount of vignette and so I mean I've reviewed a lot of wide angle lenses over the last several years and a a lot of them have much heavier vignette than what this does. You know, one of the most notable offenders is the more recent Canon 16 to 35 millimeter F 2.8 L Mark III, which had extremely heavy vignette at 16 millimeters um, at, at F 2.8. We see that with this lens by F 2.8, uh, the vignette is basically all cleared up. And so you get a really nice, even illumination across the frame. Light transmission seems to be very good. Now in our next segment, we're going to uh, break down a few other optical qualities, including a uh, flare resistance, which we'll look at. We're gonna look at distortion a little bit more closely. And I am hoping, pray that uh, all of these storm systems that have produced gray days for us here in Ontario, that I will be able to get a little bit of clear sky and so that I can try to get some coma. I'll test coma performance either way. I can do it with a laser pointer in a lab. That's not nearly as exciting and dramatic as looking at some great astro images. And so whether or not I'm able to get those outdoors, I will test the coma performance as well. Since that's one of the key metrics, a lot of people will be interested in using this lens for astro, including myself, if I could just get the weather for it. Um, but all of those things we'll cover in the next episode. I'll also look at, you know, things like autofocus performance and then give you a final verdict on the lens as we move ahead. In the meantime, if you'll look down in the description below, you can uh, get a link there to my image gallery, which I continue to upload images there as I, you know, take them as a part of my review process. Beyond that also, you can find some buying links if you want to put in an order for yourself. Follow me on social media, become a patron. Remember, there are some, um, you know, there are some raw files there for my patrons to take a look at from this lens. And finally, of course, if you haven't already, please click that subscribe button. Thanks for watching. Have a great day.